Hello, connoisseurs and card sharks. My name is Steepy Skine, and a persistent criticism I've had of League of Legends for, oh god, over 10 years now, is that as a game, it does a pretty poor job of telling stories in its own narrative universe. On the Rift itself, narrative is delivered primarily in the form of voice lines, which are very infrequently updated, if ever, to match changes to the champions that they are attached to. And besides that, there's only ever really small meta-narrative experiments like Kha'Zix and Rengar's jungle minigame, which... Is that even in the game anymore? I know they've removed a bunch of those. Part of the reason for that is that League of Legends as a game simply isn't a good vehicle for narrative at all. League of Legends is to the Runeterra universe as Smash Bros is to Nintendo IPs. And in much the same way that you're never going to get a compelling Legend of Zelda or Metroid narrative from a Smash Bros game, League of Legends just isn't ever going to deliver a great story about Garen or Kai'Sa, at least not in its own gameplay. One of the consequences of this is that narrative just has never really been a priority for League of Legends. Champions are given a biography and a short story upon release, sometimes not even that, and after that, it's basically a big fat roll of the random chance dice whether or not we ever get to see an update again. Some champions, like Miss Fortune, get everything from animated shorts to comics to an entire freaking video game showcasing her story, while others... Well, they get to continue to exist in the game, primarily because their mains would get upset if Riot deleted them. And this is a very frustrating thing about trying to engage with these characters. It is impossible to know one day to another which champion story Riot is going to choose to care about, which champion gets updated, who gets a new visual update, or even who gets new voice lines to match progression in their story. In recent years, external products have started to pick up that slack. There were the Marvel comics, although that collaboration went down in absolute flames after a little bit, and Arcane, and especially the Riot Forge games, are promising to do a lot to pick up what League of Legends can't be bothered to lift itself. But these things pale in comparison to what I consider to be the true hero of Rune Terra as a narrative space. A game which not only breathed life into a desperately stale IP, it reinvented the universe of Rune Terra. It reinvented its nations, its species, its ecology, its mythology, and delivered in three years all of the world building that League of Legends itself couldn't do in 13. Legends of Runeterra, a collectible card game of all things, is proof, if ever you needed it, that a picture is worth a thousand words. With its vibrant and extremely high quality art and hundreds and hundreds of cards, it is the uncontested king of world building in the universe of Runeterra. It would take me hours to list the contributions, retcons, additions, and expansions that this game has made to the League of Legends universe. We didn't know what Bandle City, the home of the Ordals, even looked like before this game stepped up to show us, but we can get a sense of the scale of its contributions by focusing in on a few case studies. So, today, let's talk about the champions that Legends of Runeterra has saved from the neglect of League of Legends. Rumble is a member of an elite club. I call it the Club of Forgotten Champions, where he resides, along with champions like Zillion, Twitch, Shaco, Kog'Maw, Kennen, and Cho'Gath. These are characters who do not receive stories, whose lore has not been updated, and who, despite being in desperate need of them, are generally not even considered for visual updates. To be fair to Riot, they have managed to shrink the club a little bit over the last few years, but Rumble remains eternally forgotten and unconsidered. Once upon a time, Rumble's story was all about being a Yordle supremacist, more or less. He was a bullied little runt of the litter who got resentful about humans reaping the benefits of Yordle technology. This was a time before Hextech was fully realized in the lore, so the Yordles were like the tech race in the universe. And he felt disrespected by humans dismissing Yordles as cute or inconsequential. So, he runs away from Heimerdinger's Yordle Academy of Excellence in Piltover, and builds himself a big shambly fighting mech and joins the League of Legends, the old fighting tournament that the game is named after because he wants to prove the superiority of Yordle technology. The joke is, of course, that Rumble's mech is complete junk. It's a terrible piece of shambling garbage that only works on accident, so ha ha, superior Yordle technology, Rumble is an idiot. 
it's not exactly great characterization. Then, in 2014, Riot made The League of Legends non-canon to League of Legends. They scrubbed the mention of it from Rumble's biography, but all the other outdated anachronisms are still there, and his character no longer makes any sense from a lore perspective. Yordles no longer have superior technology to humans, there is no longer a Yordle Academy in Piltover, and there is no longer a League of Legends for him to fight in to prove the superiority of Yordle technology. So now what is he? What is his deal? What's he about? What is Rumble even supposed to do? And why is anyone supposed to care about him? Now he did get a short story about, oh, three years ago at this point, which placed him in Shurima of all places, and that seemed to be part of an attempt to sort of recontextualize him and give him a new thing to be. In Shurima, he used junk to build mechs, and he helped the kid fight off some bullies so that he could yell at the kid about not appreciating the glorious potential of junk to be turned into mechs. It was something, but it was barely something. Rumble now had a location, but no real sense of what made him a champion, no real sense of what made him exceptional. So, Legends of Runeterra to the rescue. In Legends of Runeterra, the portals that lead to Bantle City not only allow Yordles to teleport around the world, they also pick up junk. All sorts of trash, broken doodads, and unwanted refuse makes its way through the portals into enormous junk piles in Bandle City, where the Yordles find it, and Rumble isn't the only one who's figured out how to make mechs out of it. So Carl here, fresh off of running the fighting pits in Noxus, gets it in his head to organize a mech fighting tournament and make bank off of the tickets. And Rumble is one of the top prize fighters. In Legends of Runeterra, Rumble keeps his vibe of being a perpetual underdog looking to prove himself. He keeps his angry, scrappy, manic overconfidence, but rather than being a lone weirdo who's terrible at building mechs, despite being convinced of the superiority of Yordle technology, now he's actually amazing at building mechs. He's working with refuse and junk and discarded garbage and still manages to put together something that can win a wild and chaotic destruction derby battle royale. Hell, he even manages to make Tristy his mech sentient and sapient. Rumble now has a purpose, not only as a person, but also as a character. Why is he a champion? He's a champion because he's the best damn junk mech engineer on the face of Runeterra. He is aspirational rather than being a joke. He's striving for something rather than just impotently lashing out. He's creative soul with drive and ambition rather than essentially the League of Legends version of a small-minded, resentful racial supremacist. And I really can't overstate how big a difference it makes that the story no longer thinks that Rumble is a loser. The story no longer points at him and goes, ha ha, look at this dumb idiot who thinks this mech is cool. Ha ha, what an idiot. Ha ha, what a jackass. Now it points at him and says, he built that mech in a cave with a box of scraps. He put that together from nothing. And now he's kicking ass in the coolest Robot Wars mecha battle royale you've ever seen. Hell yeah. There's a reason to like Rumble now. There's a reason to want to see his adventures. It also doesn't hurt that Tristy looks a lot better in Legends of Runeterra than she does in League of Legends. The extra arms, the bigger rocket battery, the bulkier legs, and the proper cockpit makes both her and Rumble look as aspirational and cool as the story now thinks they are. Like, seriously, Riot, you gotta crank up production on those visual updates in League of Legends because, come on, don't leave him looking like this. Ah, Zillion. Another champion trapped forever in Riot's unescapable memory hole. Zillion has only ever had a biography to his name. No short stories, no comics, no animated shorts, no nothing. He's a time mage who saw the region of Ikathia get devoured by the Void when they tried to use its power to rebel against Shirima. In a moment of desperation, he manages to use his knowledge of time magic to freeze his tower, a handful of Ikathian refugees, and a bit of Ikathian land outside of time, thus saving it from destruction. But that magic also unmoored him from temporality, causing him to simultaneously exist across thousands of timelines, forever searching for just one where he has managed to save his homeland from the Void. You'd never know any of that tragedy to look at him, though, because he looks like an absolute cartoon with his giant cuckoo clock, onion hair, and goofy robes. He looks like a cheap tie-in toy from some B-tier 90s children's cartoon, and the most Riot has ever done to update him is 
improve his textures a little bit, which is rather like drizzling gold dust on a turd at this point. Zillion is undisputedly one of the ugliest models with some of the worst animation in the entire game, which perhaps explains why he's the only champion who has gone more than a thousand days without a skin three times in a row now. Zillion has a really interesting concept, but ultimately one which is disconnected from the rest of the world of Runeterra. No other characters know him, nobody's story really ties into his, and as such he has no character. He's just the Time Mage guy. He has never had an actually defined personality beyond a set of surface wants. So, Legends of Runeterra makes the simplest but best possible adjustment to him. Now, Zillion isn't a lonely hermit mage floating across timelines without anyone being aware of him. He's a teacher. He travels across the timelines and assembles a group of the most promising magical talent he can find. He takes them under his wing as students and passes on his knowledge in the hope that together they might be able to do what he cannot do alone. Zillion now has a personality. He's an affable, forgetful granddad wizard professor kindly taking care of his extended found family of students who can turn on his seriousness on a dime to wield unspeakable cosmic power when the situation calls for it. Zillion's Ekathian Time Academy is a setting which is absolutely begging for a series of young adult novels following the exploits of his students. Zillion as this loving father figure who is nonetheless haunted by the weight of a hundred lifetimes on his shoulders where he has seen everyone he loves die a thousand times from all of his mistakes, that's a characterization with a ton of weight behind it. Legends of Runeterra Zillion is a character that I want to know about. I want to see what he gets up to. He's vulnerable, he's powerful, he's interesting, and it doesn't hurt that they managed to update his character design to no longer look so stupid. His time powers now manifest as portals between the timelines, which he conjures inside of these concentric sun disk looking golden sigils. Not only does this look immeasurably more badass, it also helps associate him much more strongly with the Shuriman region that he's supposed to be from. The way that he tucks his beard into his belt is also just such a well-observed little bit of characterization. It makes him kind of adorable and tells us something about his practical nature beyond being a venerable old wizard. I'd really like that a lot. Jax is not quite as memory-holed as Zillion. Riot has shown some interest in updating his character, but much like Rumble, he's a champion whose concept once upon a time was tied pretty inextricably to the League of Legends. And once that was retconned out of existence, our boy here became kind of rootless. It used to be that he fights with a lamppost because the League of Legends said, you are too good at fighting with weapons, nobody can defeat you, that's not fair, stop using weapons. And so he started fighting with a lamppost basically just to flex on everyone. Now that the League of Legends doesn't exist anymore, though, his new story sees him cast as one of the only survivors of Acathia's fall into the Void who didn't take refuge in Zillion's Tower. And his concept is that he's a wandering warrior traveling the world looking for the best and most powerful fighters he can find to help him prepare to defend the world from the Void's inevitable coming. He's basically Rune Terran Nick Fury in that way, and under those circumstances it doesn't really make sense for him to be using a lamp post as a weapon as a flex. He's not showing boating in a fighting tournament anymore, he's literally trying to save the world, why would he do that? Beyond that problem though, Jax is also just an old, old character design, as old as Zillion, in fact, and he too has never been updated. He has held up surprisingly well, all things considered, which is a credit to his character design, but visually speaking, the way that he looks just doesn't world build for him, and it doesn't tell his story. Nothing about this guy really says that he's a 3500 year old weapons master from the Shuriman continent carrying the light of a dead civilization as his lone weapon against an overwhelming enemy that threatens to consume us all. So, how does Legends of Runeterra save him? Well, first First of all, they update his character design. Jax's look now incorporates the iconography and the aesthetic design of Shurima in general, and his design has been moved away from the monk-like dude in obscuring robes thing that he originally had going on, and his cape is now used to give him an imposing, heroic vibe. His outfit now emphasizes strength and his muscularity, and it gives us a sense of his anatomy, which all helps sell him as the physical weapons master fighter character that he is. But rather crucially, his lamp post gets a big update. Rather than the crooked street lamp that was just pulled out of the ground that he uses in his base design, now it's a well-formed combat torch, essentially. It has a straight solid shaft and a bulb like the head of an enchanted mace. With its bright flaming head and the emblem of the sun at the base of its shaft, this now looks like the sacred torch of a civilization. Jax is quite literally the torch bearer of Acathia, the last light of hope for a dead people. 
well, besides Zillion, technically, and that idea just wouldn't work with a crumbled street lamp. Quite ironically, Legends of Runeterra gave Jax a real weapon, and it's another lamp. As important as the update to the character design, though, is the update that's happening around Jax. Since he's now traveling the world to assemble the anti-void Avengers, Legends of Runeterra gives him some goddamn Avengers to assemble. He has a traveling group of fighters from all over Runeterra, complete with their own D&D party interpersonal found family dynamics. There's a wandering shepherd from Targon who's very forgetful, a castaway sailor from Piltover who loves to fix whatever Jax breaks, a fisherwoman from Ionia who just loves to challenge, and a group of combat chefs from Demacia. There's a plucky kid from Shirima who insists that she's as big and tough as anyone else in the group, and of course, there's a haunting mirage of old Acathia, a mysterious group of ghostly warriors who spring out of the sands at strange times to fight beside Jax, while one of them admonishes him to stop running from his memories of his homeland. He cannot refute her words. He knows she's right when she accuses him. It all adds up to a version of Jax who still gets to be a cocky fighter meathead, who still gets to revel in the fun of battle, and who retains most of the personality he had before the retcon. He's still fun, he's still charming, but now there's a depth of feeling to him as well, a sense that all that loud bravado is the surface layer of a deeper person whose past matters to him. The dynamic he has with his team of companions, although it's loosely sketched out in the flavor text and voice lines, is compelling, it's interesting. And I would really love to see some stories with Jax where we actually get to hang out with them. Before we go on, thank you to the sponsor of this video, Displate. Displate is a producer of high-quality wall-mounted art pieces, helping you collect and display your passions. Displates are printed on metal, which not only lends their plates a lovely texture, but also makes them slim, light, sleek, and elegant against your wall. They offer a range of designs, both from popular brands like Star Wars, Elden Ring, The Witcher, Marvel, and DC, and from smaller and independent artists offering their works on the site. They very kindly offered to send me some of their plates to hang on my wall, and I went with this crop of Judith with the head of Holofernes by Gustav Klimt, some Shovel Knight art I really like, this Norman Rockwell, which I have always loved for its irony, as well as a piece from fellow YouTuber Vatividia's store, which has a great atmosphere, along with this lovely piece of D&D art. And my genuine impression of these things is that beyond looking good, this may be the easiest way I have ever mounted a picture to a wall in my life. You stick a protective sheet to the wall, which I'm doing rather inexpertly here, but fortunately Unfortunately, that doesn't really matter, it's still gonna look good. Then you stick a magnet to the sheet, and then, plonk, there it goes. It's just attached, and it is incredibly adjustable. You can essentially rotate it freely and move it up and down as you wish, which takes a lot of the anxiety and inconvenience out of hanging stuff on the wall. And if you ever get tired of a picture or want to change things around, well, you can do it one-handed while trying to film the process with your phone. It is that easy. So, if you're in the market for something nice to put on your wall, go check out the galleries available at Displate. And if you find something you like, you can get up to 30% off of your purchase with the link down in the description or using the discount code TBSKYEN, which also helps me out by letting Displate know that you came from me. Visit Displate today and start collecting your passions. Staying with lonely weapons masters trying to rebuild their lost communities, say hello to Master Yi. Now, Master Yi is not really in the Neglected Champions Club. He has received skins, he has received a visual update some years ago now, and Riot has even published stories about him. But God save this poor man, his character design is so ugly. Now, his visual update happened 10 years ago at this point, so what I'll say for him is that it's a visual update that does reflect what League of Legends looked like at the time. And back then, the aesthetics of Ionia were much much less developed than they are now. But even so, my man looks like a discount action figure. He looks like he's from a crappy He-Man knockoff show. He looks like every mention of his name should be followed by the phrase, batteries not included. He wears boots that look like they were practically molded out of plastic, and those boots have swords on them that he doesn't even use for anything. His armor design is a chunky, unwieldy, boxy construction that directly contradicts his characterization as an agile and graceful sword master. So, Legends of Runeterra to the rescue with a substantial redesign. And this one is all about shape language. 
Master Yi still has his helmet, still has his sword with the rings on it, he even still has his armor, but look at the style in which these things are presented. Ionia is all about mystical harmony with nature. Traditional Ionians build houses by asking the spirits of the trees and the earth to shape themselves into habitable structures, and it has this organic, flowing, sharp, curved look that defines the aesthetics of the entire region, especially in Legends of Runeterra. So his chest armor is now this short, fairly light-looking rounded piece with organic decorations laid into it. His shoulder guards are now these sharp leaf shapes, like the blades of grass flowing around him in the air there. And in fact, leaves and blades of grass are a primary motif of his whole design. You see it in the decoration on his boots and shoes, and the embroidery on his robes, and especially on his sword. It already almost looks like the curved branch of a tree, complete with vines running down its length, and the bright green edge is frayed with leaf patterns, accentuating the curvature and the slice of the sword's edge. Even the rings attached to the blade are now shaped like the outlines of tree leaves. In his level 2 art, we can even see that his robes are sewn to flare out into that same leaf-like blades of grass pattern. There's a deep emphasis here on the connection to nature, which ties into the philosophy of Wuju that Master Yi is the master of. It comes from Ionia's nature, and it comes from its spirit realm. This is a big part of the aesthetic contrast that the region has with Noxus, Ionia's primary enemy, which is all about big, blocky monsters monumental brutality, and one of the worst things about Master Yi's old design is that his armor, maybe except for the colors, kinda looked like it came from Noxus. In battle, Master Yi here looks infinitely more agile. The way he's presented here, he flows like water. He swoops and curves and circles and weaves. He looks like the embodiment of martial grace, where his original design looks like a bunch of Lego bricks held together with sticky tape in comparison. It cannot be overstated just how much of a clutch save Legends of Runeterra has performed on Master Yi with this character design update, how much more deeply it integrates him into his home region, how much better it expresses his story, and his concepts and who he's supposed to be. Like, yeah, the Seven-Eyed Splinter Cell helmet will always be a goofy relic of League of Legends cartoonish past, but at least now, in this new context with its organic petal-like shape design, it's goofy in a way that looks good. Gwen was created for the Ruined King event. She was created to play a part in the narrative around Viego and to play a role in the Sentinels of Light visual novel. And that is kind of her biggest problem. Gwen is a doll, given life by a piece of the soul of her creator Isolde, the dead wife of Viego, the ruined king. Viego is compulsively obsessed with reviving Isolde, no matter how many people have to die for it, but Gwen doesn't especially want to die, nor does Isolde want to come back to life, so Viego needs to be stopped. Now, setting aside my profound disappointment with the ruination and the Sentinels of Light event as a whole, thematically, Gwen's character really actually works. She is Isolde's childhood imaginary friend come to life. She's a literal embodiment of Isolde's innocence, something which Viego stole from Isolde when he pulled her into the life of a princess. So she makes a good opponent for Viego, a good counterpoint. In order to bring Isolde back to life, he would have to kill her innocence all over again. That's a solid thematic way to show how destructive and selfish his behavior is. The trouble is that Viego is defeated now. He's been made mortal and sealed away inside the ruins of Camavor, and the book has been closed on his invasion of Runeterra. So now what for Gwen, then? Her entire character revolves around him. It revolves around the tragic story of Isolde and Viego. All her themes were pointed at him. Without him, what is Gwen about? Akshan had sort of the same problem, he was also created for the Ruined King event, and most of his story pointed in that direction, but he at least has his whole robbing from the warlords and defending the innocent motivation that he got from his mentor. He at least has a home culture and some other conflicts to pursue. Gwen doesn't really have anything like that. Her primary function was to be an opponent of Viego. Her characteristics were formulated in opposition to him. Her character's mission was to make the world safe from him. Once she's removed from that context, what's she about? We know that she's good, we know that she's curious and imbued with a great love of life and that she's adventurous, but how does that make her different from any other generic good guy. What is Gwen's thing? What is the adventure that only she could go on? What is the story that could only be told about her on Runeterra? 
League of Legends created her for the ruination, but once her purpose was served, they pretty much didn't seem to care what her significance was supposed to be after that. So, Legends of Rune Terra to the rescue, and what do they do with her? Why they send her to prom, of course. Gwen's cards in Legends of Runeterra tell the story of her receiving a strange and ghostly invitation out of nowhere, which leads her to a secret and mysterious castle on the Shadow Isles where, oh my, a court of spirits are having a ball. There are dancers and musicians, a snarky butler who complains, a cheerful conductor who plays just what you want to hear, and a boisterous host who pipes up, there she is, our guest of honor. And there, somewhere in the crowd is a tall, handsome man with long, bright hair and a strangely familiar voice who begs her only for a dance and to take his hand in hers. Dear lady, would you honor me with a dance? Oh yes, nobody's ever asked me before. When I first saw you, dear Gwen, my heart skipped a beat. Strange, I feel almost as if we've met before. Perhaps elsewhere, but we are here now. I should like to dance all night, if you would join me. You're asking me to dance? Well, of course. And then, of course, right as they're about to dance, the ghosts of the Black Mist burst in, and Gwen with her magical scissors must take up the fight and save the ball and be the hero of the hour. This is, in other words, exactly the kind of exciting romantic adventure that a young girl might imagine for her beloved princess doll as they play in the garden of a small village in Camivore. Isolde created Gwen as an imaginary friend whom she could pretend was going on magical adventures, attending glamorous balls, fighting off the bad guys, and being romanced by the handsome prince. She was, in essence, Isolde's wish-fulfillment self-insert character. So what Legends of Runeterra does here is reorient Gwen away from being an opponent of Viego and towards being the legacy of Isolde. Isolde's romantic innocence was stolen away by Viego when he married her. He brought her into loneliness, stress, and sorrow, and eventually the life that he pulled her into would kill her. So Gwen does for others what Isolde could not do for herself, and she protects innocence, protects joy, and protects romance. In this way, she keeps her creator's spirit alive. Quite literally. Gwen is the champion who treks through the haunted forest and finds a spooky mansion and befriends all the ghosts that haunt the place. She gives the crying child ghost back its teddy bear, she puts flowers on the grave of the wailing widow, and kicks out all the nasty boogeymen that have moved in. If the black mist that Viego created represents an undead afterlife tormented by your own worst demons, which is how he died, then the hallowed mist in which Gwen travels is an afterlife spent in your most delightful dreams, going on the adventures you always imagined as a child. Legends of Runeterra has given Gwen something to be, adventures to go on, and themes and quests to pursue. They figured out what her thing is, and in so doing, they saved her from being forgotten as a mere accessory to Viego's story. Always on the outside. Finally, of course, there is this one. Seraphine, as a League of Legends champion, launched with a number of problems, not the least of which being a fuck up on the part of the writers that ended up creating some horrible unintended implications about her character. Now, all of the Bracker and stuff seems set to be retconned completely out of existence with the Skarna rework, so let's leave that in the past and focus on the clever things that Legends of Runeterra does with her in the present. I have already done a very long video on Seraphine, giving a critique of her character design and especially of how Riot handled her, so you can see that if you want the full details on her character, but we'll quickly cover some of it here. First, her animating concept, like the one thing that is most important to her character, is that she's meant to be an avatar of unity between Piltover and Zaun, a champion for a reconciliation of the people of the two divided cities. But her base character design, first of all, it doesn't reflect her deep connection to either city very much, but the design elements that are present mostly bias towards Piltover. There just isn't really any Zaun aesthetic to be found here. Second, she's someone who's meant to be a sensitive, empathy-driven, fairly shy person, whose joy in music comes from feeling deep connection to her audience, but she's presented, especially in her animation, as a rather aloof, cocky pop diva who floats on a gilded stage above the world, who stands apart from her audience, both aesthetically 
and literally. There is thus a big gap between what her character is meant to be and meant to say, and what most people actually perceive from her. Even her fans in the community sometimes seem to prefer treating and perceiving her more as a hyperfem, glittery, cute pop star than a social activist, more as the KDA Seraphine than the shy, sensitive, cultural idealist Seraphine who's stuck between two worlds and trying to heal their conflict. And you can't really blame them for that, because KDA Seraphine is the one that Riot promoted. That's the character who got a music video and a comic and a Twitter account. That's the character that Riot spent the most effort getting people to like. So, how has she been changed in Legends of Runeterra? Well, the first thing I want to gush over here is the hair. Now, I confess, it never even entered my mind that Seraphine might be dyeing her hair. The character as presented doesn't really imply it, and Runeterra is no stranger to people with wild natural hair colors. But it's genuinely such a clever move here. Her natural hair color is brown, which is the most common, the most, air quotes, boring, normal hair color, and the bright, pink, unignorable, iconic Seraphine hair is a costume, essentially. Seraphine, the pop star, is a persona. It's a performance. It's who she has decided she needs to be to get herself heard. And that detail alone changes a lot about how you interpret the character. For example, all of her animation, which seems so aloof and self-centered, well, now we know that that's not the real her. That's not the authentic Seraphine. This is choreography. It's all a show. And so that dissonance becomes resolved. But it's also clever because the act of actively dyeing her hair into a wild color, well, that's kind of punk, actually. That's something which they do not do in Piltover, but they do do it in Zaun. With this change, her wild bubblegum pink hair becomes an active decision to associate herself aesthetically with the Undercity, which is the thing that has been missing the most from her character design. Which leads us into the next thing we should note, which is all the leather that she's now wearing. Piltover and Zaun are, fashion-wise, located in a steampunk Victorian slash Edwardian and Industrial Revolution aesthetic, with a bunch of 80s punk thrown in for Zaun. This means that in Piltover, we've got lots of poofy white shirts, lots of high collars, and lots of light, airy fabrics. In Zaun, meanwhile, you get coarse, thick fabrics, usually with stripes, a lot of overalls and boiler suits, a lot of leggings and heavy boots, mixed in with that 1980s classic punk aesthetic for the rebellious spirit. What the two CDs have in common, however, is the leather. The fashion of both regions incorporate lots of undyed brown leather into the aesthetics, and lots of vests also, and so that becomes a unifying aesthetic touchpoint between the two cities. Seraphine's original design has barely any leather in it. It's on her belt and her shoes, but everything else is gold and brass and, broadly speaking, that light, airy Piltover aesthetic. Leather was a part of her design for much of the concept process, but for whatever reason got removed somewhere along the way. Legends of Runeterra brings leather to the forefront of her design, both in her civilian outfit and in the stage costume. It focuses on that unifying thing, that thing that both Zaun and Piltover have in common. And so Seraphine now wears a leather corset, leather belts, leather pouches, leather gloves, and a leather harness. She even has a long, well, maybe it's fabric and not leather, but a long duster coat in that same earth tone of brown. So visually, aesthetically, this version of Seraphine incorporates much more of both of the cities that she's supposed to represent, whose unity she's supposed to represent. It grounds her so much more in Piltover and so on, which I argue is actually necessary for her character design to work at all. Now, the last thing that Legends of Runeterra does is bring Seraphine down to earth, and it does it with a guitar. Guitars are inherently folk instruments, even including the electric ones. As instruments, they're associated with blues, with rock and roll, with folk, and yeah, with punk also. And so on that level as an instrument, it places Seraphine much more squarely in the space of working class music. But just as importantly, the way that her guitar is designed says something about the person who plays it. And Seraphine's guitar is handmade, which first of all is something that early rock and blues musicians literally did. They made their own electric guitars. But more importantly, that is the spirit of Zaun and Piltover. Tinkering, inventing, engineering, and making. That is what those cities are all about. Seraphine rocking up with a guitar she built herself instantly connects her to those parts of her city's traditions. It emphasizes her identity. 
In the base game, Seraphine's stage, which is essentially her instrument there, looks really expensive. It looks expensive, it looks magical, and it's covered in brass and colorful gemstones. It's again something which sets her apart from the ordinary person, something which literally lifts her above them. A guitar, on the other hand, I mean, any busker on a street corner has a guitar. Guitars are accessible, they are common. Every garage band and half-assed high school punk band has guitars. They are, aesthetically and thematically, of the people. Legends of Runeterra did not fundamentally overhaul Seraphine. It's not a remake, it's just a reframing. The guitar and the leather brings her down to earth and associates her visually much more closely to the cities that she cares about. And details like the dyed hair and the homemade instrument and the look at what she looks like out of her costume reframes her League of Legends incarnation and all of its problems as a performance, a deliberate affectation, which then becomes storytelling about the character. She's still a bright pink, high femme, cheerful, idealistic, optimistic pop star. She's just framed in a different context. It's testament to how much storytelling you can do just by altering a few details. Oh, and also, I would like to start a petition to change Seraphine's home guard animation in League of Legends to her riding this scooter, because I really love that they gave her a scooter somehow, it just fits her so well. The Rune Terra that we get to see through the lens of League of Legends is mostly a fairly stale place. It exists only in pockets and bubbles that surround its champions. All the action, all the story, and all the life is there, and anywhere that a champion isn't currently going on an adventure might as well not really exist. And as we've seen, even for the champions of League of Legends, that state of life can be highly conditional. Certain champions get a lot of love, and others are simply given the cold shoulder and left to rot, becoming more outdated by the day. Legends of Runeterra, on the other hand, is a game not about the champions, but about the world. It's about its creatures, its landmarks, its magic, and its people. That's where it draws its cards from, quite literally. During the period of high investment that followed the launch of the game, it had animated shorts and cinematics, and it had an exhilarating escalation of production quality. The game went really hard on exploring those things, but that period might be quite over now. Legends of Runeterra had an ambitious plan to expand the Path of Champions mode, to use it to deliver narrative and storytelling through a roguelike deck-building experience. They were deeply committed to this, until all of a sudden they weren't. Seemingly overnight, Riot pulled the plug on all of that. It's not a secret that the game hadn't been a top performer, it struggles to compete with other CCGs, but very, very suddenly, the entire game pivoted direction and there was a huge outflux of staff. Writers, artists, editors, and designers either left Riot entirely, or they were moved to projects where they were more needed, or at least that was the euphemism that Riot used. The reality was that they were told to move teams, or else they wouldn't have their jobs anymore. This came on top of an order from Riot's headquarters to completely stop developing all new narrative content. As we now know, that order was given because with the success of Arcane, management decided that all of the narrative content of the League of Legends IP going forward would be aligned with the goals of the entertainment division rather than be allowed to develop independently. It's a terrible decision, in my opinion. It's a wild overreaction made from a clout-chasing mindset with no respect or regard for the work and creativity of the rest of the company's staff. But such is game development. The last few sets of cards made by the old full complement of staff at the studio are launching right now and probably will be launching over the next, I guess, year or so. And then, after that, we'll see what Riot actually has planned for Legends of Runeterra. But whatever the case, it's clear that the game's budget has been slashed, its ambition has been reined in, and I fear that that wild creative freedom that the game exhibited in its first three years is coming to a definitive end. I fear that going forwards, Legends of Runeterra isn't going to push any boundaries anymore, or try to redefine any characters, because everything it does will have to be approved by people trying to make other products creatively successful, and Legends of Runeterra will be considered merely a support of that goal. So, consider this video an ode to the first three years of Legends of Runeterra, a way to celebrate some of its creative accomplishments. This game made me fall in love with the world of Runeterra in a way that League of Legends never really managed to. And even if its future is looking, at this point, uncertain, 
I hold out hope that it gets to keep doing what it has been doing. So here's to Legends of Runeterra. May its world building live on in the MMO and in all of the Riot Forge games to come. Hey, thank you very much for watching. I've been wanting to talk about Legends of Runeterra and how it has impacted the Runeterra like, IP for a while now, because it really can't be understated how much more of a living world that Legends of Runeterra has created than League of Legends has ever managed to. And I'm not gonna lie, I'm still kind of mad about the way they gutted the game. Like, Legends of Runeterra literally put out a roadmap promising a huge expansion of the single-player aspect and the narrative, and then out of nowhere, Riot just axes them. All of a sudden, like, boom, all plans are cancelled. Hope you weren't invested or anything, and a ton of staff are forced to just leave the game. I can't imagine how bitter that must have felt for the people who worked on this. Oh well. Someone who wears a suit and uses terms like synergistic brand alignment projections probably has a very rational explanation for why knocking the legs out from under the game was a great business move, so I guess I'll just be happy and try to celebrate what the game managed to achieve before Riot Management decided to take it out behind the woodshed with a shotgun. Anyway, while we're on the subject of Legends of Runeterra, there's a lot of new cards in that game by now, and it's been a while since I did a card review stream. So um, if you want me to do one of those, leave a Joker card emoji in your comment down below. That'll, that'll let me know that you're interested. Thank you once again very much for watching. The video is sponsored, so I won't be shilling for my Patreon. I'll just tell you to remember to be kind to one another, have solidarity with those who are worse off than yourself, and may the tides of history wash gently over us all. Oh,